Just one moment, please. The president's coming to the phone. Yes, Mr. President. How are you, sir? I got something I want you to do for me. During five different decades, clandestine recordings were made within the privacy of the Oval Office, the inner sanctum of the president. Until recently, only a handful of people knew that the White House was being bugged. But now, much of Papes and Richard Nixon and Watergate immediately comes to mind. Hello, I'm Bill Curtis. You might be surprised to know that Nixon was only one of seven presidents who secretly recorded conversations. The list includes LBJ, JFK, and FDR. For years, it has fascinated historians, journalists, and the American public. What really happens, and what is said in those high-level Oval Office meetings between a president and whoever else might be in the room? But now, due to the discovery of previously unknown recordings, it's become possible to eavesdrop on some of our presidents. In this special A&E presentation of investigative reports, we'll present many of these recordings, some of which you may have never heard before. Some have been edited for time, but what makes the secret White House tapes so captivating is that they exist because they were made on the orders of the presidents themselves. Were they aiming at the president? Uh, they were aiming directly at the president. Three shots were fired uh, within three seconds. The most notorious secret taping in history took place within the walls of Richard Nixon's presidency. And ultimately, it would be one of his own clandestine recordings, a piece of audio tape just one quarter inch in width, just a few seconds in length, that would force Richard Nixon to become the first and only president ever to resign. Despite his fall from grace, Nixon defended his practice of taping in as opposed to past presidents who he knew had recorded selectively. In their cases, it was manually operated. In other words, when they had somebody coming in that they wanted to make a record of, they turned the tape on. They didn't tell people, but they turned it on so that they'd have the record. In our case, it was voice activated. Everything was taped, uh, which of course was probably stupid, uh, and yet perhaps a bit more honorable because if you weren't going to tell the individual that he was being taped, uh, far better for it to be done uh, on a general basis rather than on a selective basis. Although Nixon's tapings will be remembered as the most extensive, the most infamous, and the most damaging, they were not the first. Franklin Delano Roosevelt was the first president we know to have secretly recorded inside the Oval Office. The recordings were lost, until a historian stumbled upon them while joking about Nixon's tapes. In 1978, a professor named uh, Bob Buto was at the FDR library at Hyde Park, and he was weary of looking through the endless boxes. And as a gag, he said to one of the librarians at lunchtime, when are you going to play me the FDR tapes, a reference to the, to the Nixon tapes that had recently been in the news. And they said, we have something that might interest you. And uh, uh, Buto was astonished, and even more astonished, when he realized that these were candid conversations recorded in the Oval Office. They have the same union. They have the right witness and the legal witness in their picture. It can go wrong no Roosevelt was in office for seven years before he began making any recordings. Through the 1930s, he relied solely on his stenographers, including one of his favorites, Dorothy Jones Brady. The president was very easy to be with. I never heard him get mad at anybody, really. At, I'm talking about typists, stenographers, people around him. But he got angry if uh, he was truly misquoted. FDR's recordings began because he was misquoted following a congressional briefing. That's when another of his stenographers, Henry Kenney, suggested hiding a recorder in the Oval Office to provide a more accurate record of the president's words. But the year was 1940, and the tape recorder as we know it hadn't been invented yet. Fellow Americans, demonstrate your faith in America. 
the stenographer took his idea to the RCA Corporation, which was working on an experimental three-foot contraption called a continuous film recording machine. It used a recording needle to feed sound signals onto ribbons of motion picture film. RCA made a gift to FDR of the machine, one of only eight ever built, and dispatched the recorder's inventor, J. Ripley Keel, to install it in the Oval Office. He wanted to place the microphone in the president's lampshade, but FDR had been using a round lamp that made hiding a microphone impractical. Keel went out and bought a new lamp, chosen more for its ability to conceal than illuminate. He installed a control panel in a drawer within easy reach of the president. With these controls, FDR could start and stop the recording, play it back, or hit a switch that would record phone calls. Keel drilled holes through the bottom of FDR's desk and through the floor of the Oval Office in order to run cables down to a locked storage cabinet in the basement, where the recording machine was hidden. Although Roosevelt only intended to record reporters visiting the Oval Office, he absent-mindedly captured more. I think one thing to remember about Roosevelt's tapes is that they are accidents. He didn't mean to record the conversations that he recorded. He meant to record press conferences. And this, these little fragments of conversations are what happened before and after press conferences when they forgot to turn the machine on or off. When FDR began experimenting with his recorder in the summer of 1940, Europe was already at war. Roosevelt was balancing on a political tightrope, knowing that America must ultimately enter the war to aid England, yet also knowing that only 13% of the public approved of American participation in the war. FDR would choose to help the British by supplying them with desperately needed equipment. A secret recording of an Oval Office conversation reveals FDR confiding his concerns about the effect of the European war on America. Hitler, Mussolini, and Japan, tonight at night, feel that if they could stop American munitions from flying to England, flying, flying, ammunition, and so forth, that they could look at There'd be a lot of people that would say, Roosevelt's recorded words were prophetic. The German government did spend a small fortune trying to defeat him in the American elections in the fall of 1940. That autumn, the Japanese were also on the offensive. FDR's recorder accidentally captured the president discussing an ominous warning from Japan. The other day, a telegram was published from the chief of the Japanese Press Association, whatever that is, Mr. Naga. What? Mr. Naga. Uh-huh. Well, Mr. Naga, or whatever his name was, said, be damned, it's strange, whatever happened. I wouldn't prefer to it because no need to a bad feeling in this country, and this country is uh, ready to pull the trigger if the Japs do it. I said, do some cool thing. At the time of this recorded conversation, in October 1940, Japan had already invaded Manchuria and China, and Japanese troops were on the march through Indochina. The Japanese military threatened to take over all of Asia, and for the first time, threatened America. FDR inadvertently recorded his apprehension about this new peril in the Pacific. There will be no war with the United States, important from memory, on one condition, and one condition only. That is, that the United States demilitarize all of its naval and air and army bases in Lake, Midway, and Pearl Harbor. Well, that's the first time that any damn job has told us to get out of the way. And that had me more worried than any other thing in the world. 
The Oval Office recording of FDR discussing the threat to Hawaii was made on October 8th, 1940, 14 months before the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. timing of the secretly recorded conversation raises the accusation that FDR deliberately allowed the attack in order to manipulate the United States into the war. But the experts and those who knew Roosevelt disagree. If he had conspired to allow a surprise, why didn't he send most of the fleet out? After all, if you had just one or two ships sunk by the Japanese, it would have been sufficient to take us into the war. The president was alarmed, shocked, and of course, as you know, he was a Navy man of the first war, and to think of all those ships being sunk and, and what had happened and how we, well, it was just, it was terrifying. There was no apparent duplicity in Roosevelt's handling of Pearl Harbor, but throughout his years in the White House, FDR was from time to time accused of manipulating the truth. Harry Truman once said of Franklin Roosevelt, the trouble with the president is that he lies. When investigative reports returns here on A&E, Truman's charges that Roosevelt sometimes lied would be confirmed. Confirmed in Roosevelt's own recorded words. fascinating conversations Franklin Roosevelt recorded in the fall of 1940 was with A. Philip Randolph, perhaps the most influential civil rights leader at the time. When this recording was made, the United States military and most of the country was still segregated. Randolph wanted the president to create the first integrated American combat force since the American Revolution. remarkable enough for anybody to interrupt FDR and to talk as much as he did in a meeting. But for a black man in that time, uh, it's absolutely extraordinary. I don't know any other conversation with FDR that went that way. But Roosevelt, uh, I think, on the whole, thought it would be a good idea if someday the armed forces could be integrated. But it wasn't high on his priority list. And he was basically, I think, trying to buy time on the subject. We are not the recording caught FDR making a false assurance. In fact, Roosevelt was not integrating combat forces and had no immediate intention of doing so. I think FDR's view about uh, blacks was very much of his time. He, he was an aristocrat, he hadn't known very many, and so he had sort of a paternalistic view of the subject. We are training a certain number of musicians on board ship. Uh, the ship's bad. Now, there's no reason why we shouldn't have uh, a color band on some of these ships because the band good at it. The political stakes at this meeting were high because uh, blacks for the first time in 1936 had voted overwhelmingly Democratic as opposed to Republican for the party of Lincoln. And he did not want to lose those votes. But FDR did not want to lose white votes either. And he seemed willing to say anything that would appease all of his constituents. Roosevelt had a fairly creative 
relationship with the truth. And I think he could convince himself quite often that what he was saying was the truth for the moment. A week, A week after the Oval Office meeting with A. Philip Randolph, the White House announced that not only would segregation in the military remain in force, but that Randolph had agreed with the continuation of the policy. When the White House uh, announced that A. Philip Randolph had agreed to that, there was a huge uproar in the black press. There, were, there was a rally in Harlem. Uh, Randolph objected strenuously, and uh, the White House backed down, and Roosevelt appointed a commission to, to look into it. Despite the controversial incident with Randolph, Roosevelt managed to keep 67% of the black vote and was re-elected to an unprecedented third term in 1940. In the more than 12 long years that FDR held the presidency, he had only used his recorder for 11 short weeks in the autumn of 1940. He stopped without explanation just after winning the election in November. As far as we know, he never listened to the recordings. Franklin Delano Roosevelt died at 3.30 on the afternoon of April 12, 1945. At 7.09 that evening, Harry S. Truman took the oath of office. One of his early decisions as president involved secret recordings. Truman would soon learn of FDR's secret recorder, a recorder that now had not been used in years. When the secret White House tapes returns, the man from Missouri would change that. Soon after Harry Truman became president in April of 1945, he was briefed on FDR's secret sound machine. It had not been used in over four years, but was still wired into the Oval Office. Truman was intrigued. He wanted to see how the machine would perform and what the recordings would sound like. He authorized a test just six weeks into his presidency. The occasion was a press conference immediately after the end of the war in Europe. This 1945 recording reveals Truman's surprising sense of humor as he jokes about, of all people, the chief architect of the Nazi extermination camps, Heinrich Himmler and Adolf Hitler. After the press conference, which was recorded without the knowledge of the reporters, Truman listened to the playback. According to one of Truman's stenographers, the president immediately began having doubts about using the system. But he made a few more test recordings. One of Truman's few surviving secret recordings, made early in his presidency, revealed the vulnerable man inside the Oval Office. Truman ultimately ordered the machine dismantled. His recordings were shipped to the Truman Library, where they remain today, largely forgotten by history. When Dwight David Eisenhower entered the Oval Office in January 1953, he had already been making recordings of some of his conversations and phone calls for over 10 years. In the 1940s, General Eisenhower had used a dictaphone machine to record his phone calls and conversations at the Pentagon. In 1951, when Eisenhower was sent to command NATO forces in Europe, he had ordered recording equipment installed in his new headquarters in a Paris hotel. But the 
hotel was bristling with electronic gear left behind by the Nazis during the German occupation. The static made it impossible for Ike's dictaphone system to function properly. It took three weeks of removing German wires before the American secret recording could begin. Soon after being sworn in as president, Eisenhower began exploring the possibility of bugging the Oval Office. He was motivated by the same reason as Roosevelt. Eisenhower's taping system was set up for self-defense. He wanted to have a record of what the other guy said. He learned early on in his presidency that politicians have a habit of coming into your office, having a conversation, going out to meet the press, and telling the press that they had said something that they hadn't said, or you had said something that you hadn't said, and so you have a record. Ike's dictaphone system, an office recording machine that had been invented at the turn of the century, worked by feeding sound signals onto a recording ribbon called a dictabelt. In order to record Oval Office conversations, Eisenhower would press a button on his desk. A red light would go on at his secretary's desk, and she would switch on the machine, which was hidden in a cabinet. Ike had to hit this switch. Um, to activate the tape recorder and that very often he would tell her before a meeting that I'm going to tape record this one with King so-and-so or Prime Minister so-and-so and then he'd forget to turn it on. And there was one person he never forgot to turn it on with and that was Dick Nixon. All the Eisenhower recordings were thought to be lost until investigative reports initiated a complete search of the Eisenhower library. As a result, Five Dictabelt recordings were recently found and are now being reviewed by the National Archives. We do, however, have transcripts of several other of Eisenhower's secretly recorded Oval Office meetings. One of the most compelling conversations took place in 1955. The transcript reveals President Eisenhower secretly negotiating for the return of American prisoners of war, still being held two years after the end of the Korean War. Eisenhower's conversation was with the Indian ambassador to the United Nations, whom he hoped would quietly intervene on behalf of the United States. The president says, we know that there are, just in military uniform alone, people that have been seen or where we have reason to believe they have been captured, some 452. We repeated our inquiries, but get no answer. Eisenhower continues, we know there are a great many more unless something happened to them. The dilemma Eisenhower faces in trying to get American POWs back from Korea is that he needs to do secret negotiations or undertake secret negotiations. And of course, it's like bargaining for hostages, which presidents cannot afford to do. The transcript discloses Eisenhower telling the ambassador, if any man in my position tried to negotiate with the life of a single American citizen, I would be repudiated completely. Eisenhower never succeeded in bringing the missing men home. Before leaving the White House, Ike had his recording system disconnected. But a new man was about to occupy the Oval Office. A man whose secret recordings would capture the country on the brink of a race war and a nuclear war. With an eye toward history, John F. Kennedy would record many of the most dramatic moments of his presidency. When Investigative Reports returns, we'll listen in. did not immediately begin taping in the White House. According to his secretary, Evelyn Lincoln, JFK sensed a major crisis was brewing in Cuba in the middle of 1962. It was then that he began secretly recording White House meetings and telephone conversations to create an exact record of events. To tape phone calls, a dictaphone machine was wired into his desk telephone. The recorder was placed near Mrs. Lincoln, who would switch it on when the president signaled her with a light. 
JFK then asked the Secret Service to wire the Oval Office with secret microphones and hidden recorders. Agent Robert Bauck's duties normally included removing bugging devices. Now, he would be planting them. Even at that time, recordings of conversations and phones and whatnot were sort of frowned upon, and it was generally not desired that it be advertised. So I requested the Signal Corps that they supply recorders to me, and they went on the open market and bought the recorders so that there would be no record of uh, where they came from. Agent Pout placed the bugs where they could be well hidden, but still close to the center of conversations. He put one in the knee well of JFK's desk, and another under the Oval Office coffee table. In the cabinet room, he concealed them in fixtures along the wall. The switches to turn them on and off needed to be in a place where the president could get easy access, but it would not be conspicuous that they existed. And for instance, on the president's desk, I placed a switch in a pen and pencil holder set. And uh, in each of the other locations, I tried to find some location where the president could move something or uh, would turn on a light or would wish to check the telephone and uh, he could turn the switch on without being obvious what he was doing. Wires from all the microphones ran into a single reel-to-reel -reel recorder hidden in a storage closet in the basement of the West Wing. When the tape ran out, a backup reel would start rolling and a light would signal in Agent Bauk's office. Bauk would seal the recorded tape in an envelope and deliver it directly to Mrs. Lincoln, JFK's personal secretary. From July 1962 until the time of his death, John Kennedy recorded 260 hours of meetings and phone calls. 51 conversations were on the increasingly turbulent subject of civil rights. A series of phone calls was recorded in September of 1962, dealing with a potentially explosive at the University of Mississippi. An Air Force veteran named James Meredith had applied to become the first African American to attend the school, affectionately known as Ole Miss. But school and state officials were determined to keep Ole Miss segregated. The federal court finally ordered the university to admit Meredith. But when he tried to register, he found his way blocked by hundreds of angry whites and the governor of Mississippi, Ross Barnett. I have said in every county in Mississippi that no school in our state will be integrated while I'm your governor. I now call on every public official and every private citizen of our great state to join with me in refusing to submit to illegal usurpation of power by the Kennedy administration. On September 29th, 1962, President Kennedy spoke to Governor Barnett, attempting to persuade the Southern segregationists to prevent a riot rather than provoke one. I've taken an oath to by the laws of this state and our state constitution, the constitution of the United States. Now how can I violate my oath of office? How can I do that and live with the people of Mississippi? Now, I know that you're feeling about the law of Mississippi and the fact that you don't want to carry out that court order. What we're concerned about is how much violence is going to be and what kind of action we'll have to take to prevent it. And I'd like to get assurances from you about that the state police down there will take positive action to maintain law and order. Then they'll, they'll know what they'll, we have they'll to do. Take, they'll take positive action, Mr. President, to maintain law and order as best we can. And now I'll we'll have 220 highway patrolmen. Right. And they'll absolutely be unarmed. Right. Well, one of them will be armed. Well, no, but the problem is, well, what can they do to maintain law and order, prevent the gathering of a mob and uh, action taken by the mob? What can they do? Can they stop that? Well, they'll do their best to. They'll do everything in that power to stop it. It was clear to the president, as you can tell from the conversation, as it was to the governor, uh, that there was going to be trouble. Uh, the governor had uh, inflamed uh, the white population, not only of Mississippi, but of the uh, neighboring states. Now, what about the suggestion made by the attorney general in regard to uh, 
not too many people to congregate and start a mob. Well, we'll do our best to keep them from congregating, but that's hard to do, you know. Oh, well, it's just time to move along. Going up on the sidewalks from uh, different sides of the streets. I understand, uh, Governor, you would do everything you can to maintain uh, that thought order. I'll, well, I don't know. I, that's what I'm worried about. I, see. I don't know whether I can or not. But now, you talk you don't understand the situation down here. Well, the only thing is, I got my responsibility. I this is not my know. order. I just have to carry it out. So I want to get together and try to do it with you in a way which is the most satisfactory and causes the least chance of uh, damage to uh, people in uh, Mississippi. That's my interest. All right. Would you be willing to wait a while and let the people cool off? People did not cool off. The next day, President Kennedy addressed the nation and appealed for calm in the streets of Mississippi. Americans are free and sure to disagree with the law, but not to disobey it. No mob, however unruly or boisterous, is entitled to defy a court of law. But it was too late. While Kennedy was on television, a riot broke out in Oxford, Mississippi. At the school building, where Meredith was being protected by 300 federal marshals and 200 state troopers, an angry mob gathered. The Mississippi state troopers suddenly melted away, leaving the federal marshals vastly outnumbered. Kennedy had mobilized 23,000 army troops, but they had not yet arrived. After the riot spilled out of control, JFK recorded another call to Governor Barnett as Kennedy searched for a way to calm the mob and protect Meredith. I'll tell you what I'll do, Mr. President. I'll go up there myself. But how long will it take you to get there? And I'll get uh, a microphone and tell them that uh, you have agreed to, re to be removed. No, 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 wait a minute. How long is, wait a minute, Governor. Now, how long is it going to take you to get there? Now, I tell you, if you want to go up there, yeah, then you call me from up there, and then we'll decide what we're going to do before we make any speeches about it. Well, all right. Well, well, no, I mean, whatever you, if you don't see, we've we got an hour to go, and that's not, uh, we may not have an hour. President, please, why don't you, uh, can't you give an order for to remove me? How can I remove him, Governor, when there's a uh, riot in the street, and they may step out of that building and something happened to him? I can't remove him under those conditions. The president thought that he was dealing with somebody that was totally unpredictable, uh, totally unreliable. And uh, I regret to say, uh, stupid. At 4 o'clock in the morning, the long-awaited 23,000 army troops finally began arriving. Two men had died. 200 were wounded. A few hours later, James Meredith attended his first class at the university. The subject, American colonial history. Just two weeks after the Meredith crisis, Kennedy would face an even bigger crisis. This time, the stakes would be much higher. The world would be on the verge of a nuclear war. The secret White House tapes will take us there. October 16, 1962, President John F. Kennedy's day began with the shocking news that the Russians were installing offensive missiles in Cuba, just 90 miles from American shores. The president immediately gathered his closest advisors, including his special counsel, Ted Sorensen. The president said to me that our U-2 high-flying surveillance planes had uh, identified what would soon be Soviet nuclear missile sites. And this was the realization of uh, our worst nightmares. And it was clearly, from the tone of his voice and the few things he said to me, the most serious crisis that the country had ever confronted. Kennedy assembled a team of 14 advisors who would be called the Executive Committee of the National Security Council, or EXCOM. The XCOM was shown the surveillance photographs, which the interpreters were certain showed Russian missiles. I don't want to exaggerate anybody's feeling when we first saw those U-2 photos, because uh, only 
and the expert analytical eye of the photo interpreter could tell you what the hell we were looking at. But when they said, that's a missile site, we believed them and we were worried. The first plan of the XCOM was to launch an airstrike against the missile sites. Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara and Secretary of State Dean Rusk debated the dangerous timing of an American attack. As the meeting began, President Kennedy took his seat in the cabinet room and quietly flipped on the record switch hidden under the conference table. If we are to conduct an airstrike against these installations or against any part of Cuba, we must agree now that we will schedule that prior to the time these missile sites become operational. Because if they become operational before the airstrike, I do not believe we can state we can knock them out before they can be launched. And if they're launched, there is almost certain to be uh, chaos in part of the East Coast or the area uh, in a radius of 600 to 1,000 miles from Cuba. I believe myself that the critical question is whether you get a particular missile before it goes off, because if they shoot those missiles, we'll generally get their board. They say it doesn't make a difference to get blown up by an ICD and fly the Soviet Union one five miles away. Mean that the missiles in Cuba had the range to cover the eastern part of the United States. If dozens of missiles had been fired, it would have easily killed 10 million people. In fact, a single nuclear missile launched out of Cuba, one of these medium-range missiles with a nuclear warhead, would have triggered World War III. The XCOM continued to meet in secrecy for several days while President Kennedy kept up public appearances to avoid any cause for suspicion or alarm. As the XCOM continued to debate their choices, the majority still favored an airstrike on Cuba. But that would risk a Soviet counterattack on Berlin. The Soviets knew they couldn't take on the United States militarily in, in our own backyard, so they would have to take the battle uh, to their own backyard. And that's Berlin. That's the place where stakes were high and where the Soviet Union had overwhelming conventional military force. four of the crisis, President Kennedy was now favoring a plan to impose a naval blockade of the island. JFK met with the Joint Chiefs of Staff, who thought the President's plan was weak. After Kennedy left the room, the Joint Chiefs talked behind the President's back. What they didn't know was that Kennedy's hidden microphones were recording every word they uttered. On day seven, JFK decided it was finally time to reveal the Cuban Missile Crisis to the American people. But first he met with congressional leaders, who were surprisingly vocal in their opposition to JFK's naval blockade. Senator Richard Russell, powerful chairman of the Senate Armed Services Committee, argued that this was a perfect opportunity to remove both the missiles and Fidel Castro in a full-blown invasion of Cuba. I'm, I'm not saying there's these people in war. And, and you will only make sure that when they, that they come, well, if they do, if you need to make sure that our ship is not gone, you won't around Miami or some other place. And we do go in that and we'll lose a great many more men uh, than we would right now. I tell you, we can't invade Cuba. Because it's uh, the case is somehow we send our force to invade Cuba. That's one of the uh, problems we've got. If we go into Cuba, we have to all realize that we are taking the chance that these missiles which are ready to fire won't be fired. But that's the game we should take. Any people prepared to take it. Uh, I think that is the value of one hell of a game. We may have the world by the next 24 hours.
encountered very negative uh, responses, uh, even from uh, some of the Democrats whom he thought would surely support him. He emerged from the room where I was uh, waiting for him, very upset, a man who was rarely upset. And he said to me, in language I cannot repeat on national television, if they want this job, they can have it. Minutes later, Kennedy made an emergency broadcast to the nation. First, to halt this offensive buildup, a strict quarantine on all offensive military equipment under shipment to Cuba is being initiated. Second, I have directed the continued and increased close surveillance of Cuba and its military buildup. Should these offensive military preparations continue, thus increasing the threat to the hemisphere, further action will be justified. I have directed the armed forces to prepare for any eventuality. Preparations were made throughout the country for the possibility of a Soviet first strike. There was particular concern in the nation's capital that they might be targeted first. The president uh, suggested to Jackie that she might want to stay away from the White House, which was a potential nuclear target, and move closer to the uh, presidential uh, uh, bomb shelter. She said no. For the first and only time in the history of the United States, the Strategic Air Command was put on a state of military readiness known as DEFCON 2. This unprecedented defense condition more than doubled the number of U.S. bombers on combat alert. Over 1,400 American planes armed with nuclear weapons took turns patrolling the skies 24 hours a day. As the second week of the Cuban Missile Crisis wore on, a confrontation seemed increasingly inevitable. Then at noon on October 27th, day 12 of the crisis, an American U-2 spy plane was shot down over Cuba. The uh, fire against our full altitude survey was shut down. We had said that we would take out a SAM, a Soviet surface-to-air missile, if they ever took out our U-2. The president said, let's wait. Let's wait. Saturday night, October 27th, 1962, was the darkest night of the 12-day-old crisis. People were tired and tempers were high and everyone was frustrated that the naval blockade was not working. And the Vice President of the United States, who had been silent through most of our uh, discussions, said when I was a boy in Texas and I walked along a road and a snake raised up his head, there was only one thing you could do to that snake, and that was to chop that head off. The president decided that uh, we should adjourn the meeting. That Saturday night, President Kennedy dispatched his brother, Attorney General Robert Kennedy, to make a secret offer to the Soviet ambassador. If the Russians would remove their missiles from our backyard in Cuba, the U.S. would remove American missiles from Turkey. The condition was that this arrangement must not be made public. If the Soviets did not accept this offer, the president was running out of options. On Sunday morning, October 28th, members of the XCOM awoke wondering if a nuclear war had begun overnight. On Sunday morning, the newscast said that Soviet chairman Khrushchev had announced that the missiles were being withdrawn. And I could hardly believe my ears. And I immediately uh, called the White House and they said, yes, it was absolutely true that the crisis had ended, the missiles were being withdrawn under our terms, and the President and Mrs. Kennedy had gone to church. A year after JFK successfully brought the nation back from the brink of nuclear war, he was assassinated in Dallas. 
In Washington, when Secret Service agent Robert Bauck heard that Kennedy had been killed, he went directly to the basement of the White House West Wing and removed the taping equipment. In the hours and days following Kennedy's assassination, President Lyndon Johnson would face the daunting challenge of holding a grieving nation together. In our second hour of this special A&E presentation, we'll hear how Johnson, on the phone with J. Edgar Hoover, attempted to keep the lid on conspiracy rumors surrounding Kennedy's death, and how he badgered Washington's mighty into doing what he wanted, and then took on the Secret Service. Also in the next hour, the recordings that brought down the Nixon presidency. That and more, when the Secret White House Tapes returns here on A&E. As we have seen in the first hour of this special A&E presentation of investigative reports, FDR did it, Eisenhower did it, and John F. Kennedy did it. They secretly recorded private conversations in the Oval Office. After Kennedy's assassination, Lyndon Johnson, who had tape-recorded phone calls when he was vice president, resumed his personal bugging shortly after being sworn in as this country's 36th president. In this second hour of the secret White House tapes, we hear how he vehemently attempted to cut short any lengthy investigation into Kennedy's murder. For Lyndon Baines Johnson, being John Kennedy's vice president was a thousand days of misery. He hated the job he had and never believed he would get the job he wanted, president of the United States. He did not believe America would elect a man from the South in his lifetime. turning on to Elm Street, and it will be only a matter of minutes before he arrives at the trademark. But on November 22nd, 1963, an act of unspeakable violence propelled Johnson into the presidency. It, it appears as though something has happened in the motorcade route. Something, I repeat, has happened in the motorcade route. That's not much where. The first recording made by Lyndon Johnson as President of the United States was not secret. It was his oath of office given aboard Air Force One. The death of JFK automatically made Johnson President, but LBJ insisted on the ceremony. Johnson's aide, Jack Valenti, was on the historic flight. He determined to be sworn in on the airplane. Now why? Because he wanted to have a picture taken to show that while the light in the White House may flicker, the light in the White House never, never, never goes out. Not wanting to appear too eager to rush into John Kennedy's chair, Johnson waited three days before moving into the Oval Office. He immediately resumed his practice of recording phone calls from his days as vice president. When he wanted to record a call, Johnson would press a button to signal his secretary, and she would turn on a dictaphone machine. Eventually, LBJ would also connect reel-to-reel -reel recorders to the cabinet room, his study, and the situation room. During his five years in the Oval Office, Johnson would record over 9,000 telephone conversations. Some of his first secretly recorded calls dealt directly with John Kennedy's death. Are you familiar with this uh, proposed group that they're trying to put together on this study of your report? No, oh, I haven't heard of that. I, I, I've seen the uh, reports on this on the Senate investigating committee that they've been talking about. I want to get by just uh, with your file and your report. It would be very, very bad to have a rash of investigations. Well, the only way we can stop them is probably... Uh, upon a high level one to evaluate your report yeah and put somebody that's uh, pretty good on it from uh, that i could select and tell the house and senate uh, not to go ahead with the investigation death johnson is very concerned to set up what becomes known as the warren commission because he himself believes that there was some kind of communist conspiracy to kill kennedy 
Just six days after the Kennedy assassination, Johnson called Senator Richard Russell to persuade him to serve on the Warren Commission. Russell was not only one of the most powerful men in Congress, he had also been LBJ's mentor in the Senate, and a man whom Johnson's daughters called Uncle Dick. But on the night of November 29, 1963, LBJ wasn't calling as a friend and protege. He was calling as the President of the United States, and he wanted something. Dick? Yes? I hate to bother you again, but uh, I want you to know that I made that announcement. Well, announcement of what? Uh, of this special commission. Well, now, Mr. President, I just can't say it. Well, Dick, it's already been announced, and you can serve with anybody for the good of America, and uh, we got to take this out of the arena where they're testifying as Khrushchev and Castro did this and did that, and uh, kicking us into a war that can kill 40 million, million Americans in an hour. What Johnson knew was that there had been CIA connections to plots to assassinate Castro. So Johnson's convinced that the Cubans got there first, and they arranged to assassinate Kennedy before the CIA could arrange to assassinate uh, Castro. He's very concerned because if it becomes known, it could create an international crisis and the danger of maybe a nuclear war. It was just 13 months earlier that the United States and the Soviet Union stood on the brink of nuclear war over the Cuban Missile Crisis. Now, LBJ wanted to avoid another superpower showdown. He wanted to act quickly before the nation's grief turned to rage, and he was not about to let Dick Russell say no to the Warren Commission. You're my man on that commission, and you're gonna do it. And don't tell me what you can do and what you can't, because uh, I can't arrest you, and I'm not going to put the FBI on you. I'm goddamn sure going to serve, I'll tell you that. I just haven't, I can't do it. I haven't got the time. Oh, well, 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 there's not going to be any time to begin with. All you're going to do is re evaluate a Hoover report he's already made. What he's saying is, look, going to give us a report which will confirm that Lee Harvey Oswald did the assassination. Now, Johnson doesn't say that. But you see, that's the implicit message that we confirm that Oswald was the only killer, and this way uh, we are going to avoid a international crisis. I don't give a damn if you have to serve with a Republican, if you have to serve with a communist, if you have to serve with a, a Negro, if you have to serve with a thug. Well, we won't start to know. Mm -hmm. say it. Okay, Dick, can we give well, up? You ought not be so persuasive. Well. I think I ought to. I think you did wrong getting Warren. I know damn well you got wrong getting me, but no. I hope you do the best you can. I think that's what you do. That's kind of American, both of you are. Good night. night. On November 29th, 1963, J. Edgar Hoover told President Johnson that the FBI report on the assassination was almost complete. It was this report upon which LBJ wanted the Warren Commission to base its work. The FBI document stated that Lee Harvey Oswald was the lone assassin and that there was no apparent conspiracy. Although it was just six days after Kennedy was killed, Hoover told Johnson that the case was virtually closed. We hope to have this thing wrapped up today, but we're being, we probably won't get it before the first of the week. This angle in Mexico is giving us a great deal of trouble. The story is there of this man, Oswald, getting $6,500. Uh, from the Cuban embassy. We, we're not able to prove uh, that fact. As interesting as what Hoover told the president is what Hoover did not tell him. That the FBI had Lee Harvey Oswald under surveillance for over six months prior to the assassination. What Hoover's worried about is that the FBI will be faulted for not knowing exactly where uh, Lee Harvey Oswald was during Kennedy's visit to uh, Dallas. How many, how many, how many shots were fired? Three. Any of them fired at me? I know. There was another, there all three at the president. All three at the president, and we have them. Uh, two of the shots fired at the president were splinted, uh, but they had characteristics on them so that our ballistic expert was able to prove that they were fired by this gun. We have the gun here also. Were they aiming at the president? Uh, they were aiming directly at the president. Uh, they, there's no question about that. And uh, we also have tested the fact that you could fire those three shots were fired uh, within three seconds. I'm going to take every precaution I can, and I, I, want, I, want, to. I want to talk to you, and I wish you put down your thoughts on that a little bit, because uh, 
you more than the head of the Federal Bureau, as far as I'm concerned. You're my brother and personal friend, well, and you have been for 25, 30 years. Well, so. I, uh, I certainly appreciate your confidence. Well, thank you. Thank you. Fine. Uh, that's it. Well, Lyndon Johnson and J. Edgar Hoover knew each other very, very well. Johnson also knew that uh, J. Edgar Hoover was a monumental SOB. But what was really important in that relationship after Kennedy's assassination was the fact that Lyndon Johnson did not trust the Secret Service. He felt the Secret Service had failed miserably in the protection of Kennedy, and he was very apprehensive about an attempt on his life. One of the Secret Service men assigned to protect Johnson was Rufus Youngblood. He'd been on LBJ's detail on November 22nd in Dallas. President Johnson cites a Secret Service hero. He is Rufus Youngblood, who distinguished himself in Dallas. He was riding in Mr. Johnson's car when the shooting began. He leaped into the back seat, pushed the vice president to the floor, and shielded him with his own body. Just five weeks later, Youngblood was in the line of fire again. But this time, it was Johnson who took aim. LBJ was enraged that a disgruntled Secret Service man had delivered a memo to one of President Kennedy's staff members, who was now working in the Johnson administration. The memo complained of LBJ's abusive treatment of the Secret Service and the desire of many agents to be transferred. I don't know who it is, Ben Aiken. First I heard of it. I'm sorry it didn't come to me. It had to come through some of Kennedy's staffers. And I can't have this lawyer in. I can't talk in front of people and have them repeat it. Well, you're absolutely right. You, you cannot have this lawyer in. I don't want any transfer, reassignment, or any other damn thing. So. Kennedy people come in and tell me that the morale is the lowest in the history. Well, I'm not going to be run by them. You know that. Uh, I do know it. Kennedy. You find out whose morale is low and get rid of some of them. And if you all don't want to do it, just, just honestly say so, and I'll get you a good assignment, and I'll get Hoover to send me a couple of 21-year-old accountants over here and properly do a good job. No, we, we'll stay with you, sir. Okay. Even former presidents found it difficult to resist the Johnson treatment. In a March 1964 phone call, Harry Truman was at the receiving end of an LBJ request. I hope I didn't call you too late, this Lyndon oh, Johnson. Oh, no, no. Plenty early out here. How you getting along? Oh, just fine. I hope you are. Oh, I'm just catching hell every day. Well, that's the sign that you're doing the right thing. How's Miss Truman? Oh, she's all right. Why don't you take her and uh, Lady Bird next day or two you fly over to King Paul's funeral at Greece? Oh, well, that's mighty nice. I, I don't think she can go either. She's tied up here. Well, I'll tell her we'll send a maid with her. We'll send somebody to take care of her. The Lady Bird will fix her a good old-fashioned uh, bourbon and water whenever she wants it. <laughs> well, well, I'll consult her about it. And can I call you? You consult her, and if she can't go, uh, you got to go because I can't go. Well, you told me that you would... Uh, uh, these Greek people love you, and I just got to have uh, the best of God, and the best of God, you and Lady Bird. She wants to say hello to you. I'll be glad. Mr. President? Well, how are you? I'm fine, and it would be so much more of a meaningful trip if you go along. Well, I'll go. Uh, you tell the president I'll go if he wants me to. Yes, sir, just a second. Now, I'll have a plane pick you up. You don't need to worry about a thing. You'll be briefed on everything, and just don't run off with my wife. Just bring her back. That's all I ask. All right. All right. LBJ's secret recordings would capture him time and again using his brilliant, manipulative powers to get him what he wanted. But when investigative reports returns here on A&E, a conflict 12,000 miles away would soon eat away at his presidency. Lyndon Johnson inherited more than the presidency from John Kennedy. He inherited a war. Johnson had been president for only two days when he began to worry about Vietnam. He told an aide, it's going to be hell in a handbasket out there. At the time, only 200 Americans, so-called advisors, had died in Southeast Asia. 
LBJ was determined to carry out Kennedy's policies. He was determined to stop communist aggression in Southeast drawing a line in the sands of Vietnam. What Johnson lacked was a plan. In a series of secretly recorded phone calls in early 1964, LBJ struggled to form a policy on Vietnam. Even his Secretary of Defense, Robert McNamara, seemed somewhat at a loss as to how to guide the president or the war. Well, Bob, yes, Mr. President. I hate to modify your speech any, Cody. It's been a good one, but I just wonder if we should uh, find uh, two minutes in there for Vietnam. You know, the problem is what to say about it. All right, I'll tell you what I would say about it. I would say that we have a commitment to Vietnamese freedom. We could pull out of there, the dominoes would fall, and that part of the world would go to the communists. Senator Richard Russell, Johnson's trusted advisor, lacked advice on the subject of Vietnam. I'm not going to move, uh, I'm not going to get this country in any extended area without some other people looking at it. I go in there, but now we're in there, I don't know how to get out. Right, well, that's what you better be thinking about. Johnson approved a quiet escalation in the number of Americans being sent to Southeast Asia. But a secretly recorded call between LBJ and National Security Advisor McGeorge Bundy reveals the continuing uncertainty of the men making the decisions about Vietnam. What is your own internal thinking on this, Mr. President, that we've just got to stick on this middle course as long as there's any possible hope? And I just can't believe that we can't take 15,000 advisors and uh, uh, maintain the status quo for six months. Now, I don't know enough about it to, to know. Uh, so I don't. I think the only thing that scares me is that the government would up and quit on us, or that there'd be a coup when we get Maybe another coup. Out. Out. What, what alternatives do we have then? We're not, we're not going to send uh, our troops in there, are we? It was a prophetic question, and it was the vagaries of Vietnam that would obscure Johnson's clear vision for America. He wanted to get out of Vietnam the worst way. He wanted to spend the money to build the great society, not to send supplies to some place 12,000 miles away, for God's sakes. He just couldn't disengage. In early 1965, Johnson was still trying to hold the line in Vietnam. He ordered a massive bombing campaign called Rolling Thunder. By the middle of 1965, the air campaign was proving ineffective. Johnson's military advisors were lobbying for a massive commitment of ground troops. But as LBJ struggled over the decision to send more American soldiers overseas, he made a secret recording of a phone call to Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara. This June 1965 tape reveals a despairing Johnson as he faces inevitable disaster in Vietnam. That, uh, it's going to be difficult for us to, very long, prosecute effectively a war that far away from home with the divisions that we have here, and particularly the potential divisions. And I'm very depressed about it because I see no program from either defense or state that gives me much hope of doing anything except just praying and guessing to hold on during monsoon and hope they'll quit. I don't believe they're ever going to quit. And I, I don't see how, how do we have any way of either, either a plan for victory militarily or diplomatically. Just five weeks after this phone call, Lyndon Johnson approved the military's request for 180,000 American troops to be deployed in Vietnam by the end of 1965. Despite Lyndon Johnson's conviction that there could be no victory in Vietnam, he plunged the nation into a disastrous war. LBJ saw no way out politically. I don't think we can get out of there with that treaty like it is, but all we've said, and I think it just loses the face of the world, and I just shut it and think what the world all up and say. 
As the war escalated, so did the opposition to it. LBJ watched as America was ripped apart by Vietnam. It was so sad that this great giant of a man was being brought to his knees by this cruel, stupid war. It pained him profoundly. He suffered terribly over that war. Uh, his younger daughter has said to me that my father, she said, committed political suicide for that war. He had to get out in 1968 because of the dissent, the division, uh, the opposition uh, over the war in Vietnam. I shall not seek, and I will not accept, the nomination of my party for another term as your president. Despite all of Lyndon Johnson's domestic policy victories, he would be most remembered for his foreign policy failure. During his final months as a lame duck president, LBJ continued to tape inside the Oval Office. One of the conversations Johnson was eager to record was with Robert Kennedy, who had decided to run for the presidency in 1968. This is the day that Johnson was gonna get his revenge. Johnson didn't particularly like Jack Kennedy. He hated Bobby Kennedy. J. Edgar Hoover has told me that chapter and verse. And so here was his opportunity after Bobby Kennedy had been so rough on him. Uh, while Kennedy was president, Jack Kennedy was president, he was going to get back at him. He was going to have the pleasure of telling Bobby Kennedy that he, Johnson, was not going to support Bobby Kennedy for president. After the meeting was concluded, and apparently it was a pretty hairy confrontation, and uh, Johnson called in the fellow that was running the taping and says, I want you to transcribe the tape. The fellow came back ashen-faced. He couldn't do it. It had been scrambled. And what had happened, apparently, they thought, was that Bobby Kennedy, who knew Johnson, had carried a little scrambling device in with him, and he put it on so that it scrambled the conversation. Once he took over the Oval Office, Richard Nixon would make more secret recordings than any other president in history, over 3,700 hours. At first, only a few people would know of Nixon's voluminous hours of recordings. But as the Watergate scandal would unfold, the whole world would learn the Oval Office had been bugged, and the secret White House tapes would help end a presidency. took over the White House on January 20th, 1960. He found Lyndon Johnson's taping equipment still in place. He had it not only in the Oval Office uh, and also in the Cabinet Room, but also uh, in the reception room where people who were to come in to see him were sitting so that he could hear what they said about him before they came in to see him. But I would say that the place that I was most surprised to find it, when I looked under the bed, just happened to, to looking for my shoes uh, a couple of mornings later, and I found all the taping equipment right under the bed. He even had the bedroom taped. Nixon ordered all of LBJ's bugs removed from the White House. Then he had second thoughts. He was particularly concerned about his own national security advisor, Henry Kissinger, who was involved in the delicate matter of withdrawing American troops from Vietnam. Nixon worried that Kissinger would say one thing to him and another to the press. With Kissinger, there was a, that's a, that's a very dark relationship, very dark relationship uh, as to who's going to get credit for what. Nixon's taping did not begin until February 1971. Two years after he became president, he ordered the Secret Service to install a new voice-activated recording system. They placed five microphones directly into Nixon's desk. Two were hidden on either side of the Oval Office fireplace. Both of the Oval Office telephones were wired. Two bugs were placed in the cabinet room, under the table. Four more were installed in his hideaway office, in the old executive office building next door to the White House. Telephones in the Lincoln sitting room were bugged. And even at the president's retreat, Camp David, 
Nixon's desk and phones were wired for sound. In transcripts of over 200 hours of recently released Nixon tapes, a dark side of the president is revealed. In 1971, when he was looking for a new commissioner for the Internal Revenue Service, the president told his aides, I want to be sure he's a ruthless son of a bitch, that he will do what he's told, that every income tax return I want to see, I see, that he will go after our enemies and not go after our friends. Later in 1971, Nixon ordered his chief of staff, H.R. Haldeman, to arrange a break-in of the Brookings Institution, a Washington think tank. Nixon believed Brookings was holding secret papers about Vietnam that would embarrass his administration. Nixon's own tape recorder documented his instructions. Break into the place, rifle the files, and bring them out. He even specifically suggested that they should go in around 8 or 9 o'clock. There is no evidence, however, that a break-in ever occurred. For 29 months, the recorders rolled on in total secrecy. Nixon would later write in his memoirs that he believed the existence of the White House taping system would never be revealed. He was wrong. In June 1972, Nixon campaign operatives were caught trying to bug the Democratic National Headquarters at the Watergate. Microphones were about to undo a president. The ones planted at the Watergate and the ones recording a presidential cover-up at the White House. Nixon's Oval Office tapes did remain secret for 13 months after the Watergate break-in. Then, in July 1973, a Nixon aide named Alexander Butterfield dropped a bombshell on the Senate Select Committee investigating Watergate. Mr. Butterfield, are you aware of the installation of any listening devices in the Oval Office of the President? I was aware of listening devices. Yes, sir. When were those devices? It was a sensational moment in American history. And you could, you could, you'd stretch to do this, but you could say that's the end of innocence. I remember the headlines, Nixon bugged himself. Well, as a matter of fact, what really, I must say, at first amused me, and then it uh, angered me, was to see the hypocritical, sanctimonious statements by people representing the Kennedy camp and the, the Johnson camp saying, oh, they had never had a taping system. They were horrified that there could have ever been a taping system in the White House. Now, come on, who are they kidding? They were installed when Butterfield told the Senate committee about the existence of the tape system in the White House, what do you think every politician in Washington was thinking to himself that night? Every single one of them, like, God, what did I say in the Oval Office? What did I tell him? Then Agnew said to Nixon the day after the tapes were revealed, listen, listen, boss, take those tapes, reels and reels and reels of them, pile them all up on the White House lawn, make them mountain, pour some gasoline on them, call in the whole working press, everybody that covers the White House, and say, watch you SOBs and light a match and toss it on there and you're home free. Now, why didn't Nixon do that? I had bad advice, bad advice from well-intentioned lawyers who had the sort of the cockeyed notion that I would be destroying evidence. I should have destroyed them. For over a year, a constitutional crisis raged over Watergate and the tapes. Nixon fought the surrender of any of his 3,700 hours of recordings. But while the White House was transcribing the tapes under subpoena, they made a shocking discovery. One of the recordings had an 18 and a half minute gap. Nixon's secretary, Rosemary Woods, said she accidentally erased the tape by once hitting the record button instead of the stop. But court-ordered testing disproved that theory. It is clear from the scientific evidence at the time that the tape, that the, that part of the tape was deliberately uh, cut into by repeated interventions of the on-off button. Bob Haldeman told me he had no doubt that Nixon sat down, listened to that tape, decided this is murder, and tried to erase it and, and screwed it up because Nixon could do nothing mechanical right. And that's what happened in the 18 and a half minutes. Nixon tried to erase it. And he pretty much botched the job. And, and, and he gave up on it and realized that 
I'll spend the rest of my life erasing these tapes if I try to do this. When a transcript of a March 21st, 1973 meeting with White House Counsel John Dean was made public, it revealed the first evidence of the president's involvement in the cover-up of Watergate. On the tape, Dean tells Nixon that the Watergate defendants were asking for hush money to keep them from testifying. Nixon responds, how much money do you need? Dean tells him that these people are going to cost a million dollars over the next two years. Richard Nixon replies, we could get that. He says, you could get it in cash. I know where it could be gotten. Finally, after a unanimous ruling by the Supreme Court, portions of the most damaging recordings were made public in August 1974. The release of what has become known as the smoking gun tape sealed Nixon's fate. The recording was made June 23rd, 1972, just six days after the Watergate break-in. On it, Nixon has heard approving a plan to obstruct the FBI's investigation of the burglary by claiming it was a matter of national security. The tape captures Nixon telling his chief of staff, H.R. Haldeman, to instruct the CIA to stop the FBI. Here, the President of the United States conspires to utilize the CIA to thwart the FBI. If anybody had any problem defining what was an abuse of power or what was an obstruction of justice, it seems to me now it was very, very clear. What you hear is Nixon trying to cover up a criminal act. I don't think there's any question. If Nixon had not had a taping system, he would have survived Watergate. Certainly, they wouldn't have been able to pin anything on Nixon around Watergate without the tapes. That's the fascination of the story. He brings himself down. Four days after the release of the smoking gun tape, Richard Milhouse Nixon did something no other president of the United States has ever done. Facing inevitable impeachment proceedings, he finally faced the nation on August 8th, 1974. Therefore, I shall resign the presidency effective at noon tomorrow. Vice President Ford will be sworn in as president at that hour. When investigative reports returns, Nixon's tapes would haunt his successor, Gerald Ford. Ford's dilemma, what to do with them? I assume the presidency, under extraordinary circumstances, never before experienced by Americans. This is an hour of history that troubles our minds and hurts our hearts. Gerald R. Ford is the only American president who was not elected to either the vice presidency or the presidency. And he took the reins of power from the only president ever to resign. When he entered the Oval Office, it was under the darkest cloud in presidential history. Just hours after leaving the White House in disgrace, Richard Nixon requested that General Alexander Haig, his former chief of staff, send all of the former president's records, papers, and tapes to Nixon's home in San Clemente, California. The Attorney General of the United States, Nixon appointee William Saxby, advised President Ford that the hundreds of boxes of materials, including the tapes, did belong to Mr. Nixon. They're being stored in the, uh, one of the upper floors of the executive office building, and the Secret Service had even expressed to me uh, uh, some concern that the weight of these boxes uh, could, could actually cause a, the floors to crash. It was a tremendous number of materials. One day early in the Ford administration, Special Counsel Benton Becker was walking from the old executive office building towards the White House when he happened to see those same boxes again. 
but this time they were being loaded into the back of an Air Force truck. I uh, asked uh, the colonel that was seemed to be in charge of the unit, uh, what is it uh, that he's transporting? And he said, I'm taking these, uh, this, these boxes to uh, uh, Andrews Air Force Base, and we're sending them, we're putting them on a plane and sending them to San Clemente. And I said, you know that President Ford has ordered that President Nixon's papers uh, and or whatever else was in those boxes shall not leave the White House. The colonel indicated to me that he took his instructions from General Haig and he would proceed to do what, he, uh, what he'd been ordered to do. Now, I'm going to make it clear to you that those boxes uh, uh, the, contained all of the records of the Nixon years, including the hundreds and hundreds of Oval Office tapes. Mr. Becker asked the Secret Service to stop the truck from leaving the White House while he went to check with President Ford. I had to look at it from the point of view as president, uh, how those documents being flown out to uh, San Clemente and given to President Nixon, how the public would understand that. If he were to send those documents and tapes to San Clemente, that history would record uh, that transmittal of records and tapes as the very final act of cover-up of Watergate. I said those tapes and those documents and all those boxes should not be moved out of the White House, period. It was up to Jerry Ford, the man who never aspired to the office, to bring trust back to the presidency. I address myself to the individual rights of Americans in the area of privacy. There will be no illegal tappings, eavesdropping, buggings, or break-ins by my administration. But Gerald Ford did not know when he made that speech was that the ghost of Nixon's taping system still haunted his White House. Once again, Ford's special counsel, Benton Becker, happened onto a startling discovery. This time, while he was having lunch at the White House, a member of the Secret Service offered to show him how Nixon's taping system had worked. Yeah, let's do it. I'd like to see that right away. So we, we went down, and there was actually one floor directly below the Oval Office. And then, in the most casual, passing remark, I was told, you know, Mr. Becker, the microphones are still in the Oval Office. And I said, what? And he said, the mic I was told the microphones from the Nixon taping system were still in President Gerald Ford's Oval Office. I was very upset. Even though I had issued a directive, nothing had been done to remove the equipment. All they did was turn off the equipment. Now, that was a step in the right direction. But uh, somebody from behind the scenes could have gone back in and turned the equipment back on. As far as I know, that never happened. But the fact that the potential existed bothered me. When Becker informed the president of the bugs still lurking in the Oval Office, Ford was in a meeting with the Secretary of State. I remember Henry Kissinger getting up in the chair and saying something like, uh, our meeting is over, anyway. I have a million things to do, goodbye, zoom, and he was gone. I, I, I have never before nor since that time ever seen Henry Kissinger move so quickly. That afternoon, every microphone in the Oval Office was ripped out from the furniture and from the walls. But removing the bugs left bigger holes than the microphones themselves had made. In photographs taken during the first few days of the Ford administration, lamps can be seen gracing either side of the fireplace. But then larger paintings suddenly appear, carefully chosen to mask the scars left behind by Nixon's bugs. Jimmy Carter entered the Oval Office in 1977. There is no evidence that he authorized any secret White House tapings. 
But Carter's successor, Ronald Reagan, would be urged by some to resume recordings in the Oval Office. When investigative reports returns, would Reagan do what Nixon had done? Should U.S. presidents be allowed to secretly record Oval Office meetings? You tell us at &E .com. The Emmy-winning series Investigative Report is moving to a new time. We don't see that there is an advantage in telling only one side of the story, and our viewers appreciate that. Hold a mirror up to the nation and face the issues that face America. Once you got the disease, you got the disease forever. A 15-year-old could download the tools associated with these kinds of attacks. Investigative Reports, now at a new time, weeknights at 10, 9 central, starting Monday, June 12th on a and &E. Nearly a decade after Richard Nixon ordered secret presidential taping stopped in the wake of Watergate, Ronald Reagan quietly made a decision. Early on in the administration, Reagan was presented with the option of restoring the phone tapings in the Oval Office uh, for national security purposes. And uh, obviously tapings were a very controversial subject ever since the Nixon days. But Reagan could see the value of it, not so much for history, but for accuracy. Uh, he saw the value of it and readily agreed to continue to tape. Might have tightened you up a little. Reagan's telephone calls to and from other heads of state could be patched through to the Situation Room in the basement of the White House. There, the calls would be captured by members of the National Security Council on an audio cassette machine. Their goal was to create a record from which memorandums of conversation, or memcoms, could be made. Reagan's tapes remain classified, but according to presidential aide Michael Deaver, an August 1982 recording captured Reagan calling the Prime Minister of Israel in the middle of a battle. Ronald Reagan had been watching Israeli guns and planes bombarding Lebanon on television newscasts. Reagan picked up the phone and said, get me Menachem Begin. Uh, and of course, that taping system had to go into effect then. During the call, Reagan told Prime Minister Begin that the scene in Beirut was a holocaust. Begin, a holocaust survivor himself, replied, Mr. President, I think I know what a holocaust is. But Reagan persisted. When Reagan put the phone down, he says that it's stopping midnight tonight. He said, gosh, I didn't know I could do that. A little more than a year after ending the shelling in Beirut, Reagan would launch his own attack against the tiny Caribbean island of Grenada. In October 1983, Marxist elements on the island had triggered the collapse of the government. Responding to appeals from neighboring islands, Reagan ordered an American assault on Grenada, which was part of the British Commonwealth. Reagan telephoned British Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher, but only after authorizing the invasion. During the call, Mrs. Thatcher angrily protested that she had not been consulted about the invasion of British territory. He was clearly unhappy. Uh, he said, uh, she doesn't agree with us. Uh, she thinks this is not the right thing to do. And I told her it was too late. I made the decision. Although the audio tape of this conversation remains classified, investigative reports has uncovered never-before-seen videotape of a closed-door White House meeting. The tape of the president briefing his cabinet officers was shot shortly after the Grenada invasion began. The footage, taped by a military team known as White House Television, was sealed the day it was recorded. We have managed to keep one thing in the administration from me. And at 5.15 this morning, a joint force landed at two spots on Grenada. Reagan's efforts to intervene in another Marxist hotspot would have a very different outcome than the assault on Grenada. The Reagan administration's plan to help finance Nicaraguan freedom fighters or Contras resulted in the Iran-Contra scandal. Late in 1986, a congressional investigation into the scandal was launched. Inevitably, investigators asked the White House if they had been making any tape recordings. They had. But Reagan's staff maintained it was their practice to reuse the tapes, and only a handful of recordings were located. 
White House officials told investigators that none of the surviving tapes related to Iran-Contra. Investigators believed them and dropped the matter. Nonetheless, government lawyers advised that the practice of electronically recording conversations should be discontinued. According to a National Security Council official, the Reagan administration then stopped the tapings. The Bush and Clinton White Houses deny that any secret taping has ever occurred in either of their administrations. The presidents who have taped have done so for a variety of reasons, but primarily it was for self-protection. They were guarding against being misquoted, misrepresented, or perhaps misunderstood. The tapes often captured more than they were meant to, leaving us an unintended record of the human side of the presidency. I can't run this country by myself. They're human beings, and they're engaged in very complicated work involving lots of other complicated human beings. I don't understand the situation down here. Well, the only thing is, I got my responsibility. This is not my order. I just have to carry it out. There's this sense of hearing the president speak in the Oval Office. You can't get closer to power than that. I don't think presidents should record their conversations, but since some of them have, they are absolutely priceless records of, uh, of what went on in that room, which is the most important room in the United States. Until recently, the dramatic tapes released of the Nixon presidency dealt primarily with Watergate. Then, in the fall of 1999, some 500 hours of other tapes were made public for the first time, further revealing Nixon's feelings. And they revealed his obsession with the Kennedys. He believed Ted Kennedy would be his opponent in 1972. And he blamed Jack Kennedy for starting that damn Vietnam War. On the matter of women in government, he said they were a pain in the neck and very difficult to handle. He thought even less of blacks and Mexicans. Of blacks, Nixon said, you can usually settle for an incompetent, because there just aren't enough competent ones. Of Mexicans, he said, finding an honest one is a problem. You can now own your own copy of the tapes. The National Archives is selling cassette copies. The price? $18 a tape. I'm Bill Curtis. Thanks for watching Investigative Reports here on A&E. Monday on Investigative Reports, is it a religion, a cult, or a lifeline for struggling alcoholics? Watch Inside AA at a new time here on a &E. A and E Home Video proudly presents the documentary program you've just seen for $29.95 plus shipping and handling. To order, call 1-800-423-1212 or visit our online store at A&E.com. Tomorrow, the exciting life of Lowell Thomas as all premiere June continues on Biography Saturday at 8, 7 central. Now, Law & Order is next on A&E. Suchet in an all-new Agatha Christie mystery, Lord Edgware dies. Tonight on A&E.